Yeah. All right. Well, I think we'll get going and let other folks roll in as as we are. But uh, thank you everyone again for coming to another one of these webinars and the you know in a collaboration between RI and the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority on Crisis Now and principles of Crisis Now, both you know based on the RI model and also SAMHSA's national guidelines for best practice. And I will hand it off to Georgia and let her and Dr. Chuck introduce themselves in the next steps. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. And thank you uh, so much for being here today for another Crisis Now webinar. Um, I'm Georgia Madeira. I'm a senior principal consultant with RI International. And today we'll have Dr. Chuck to speak with us on the RI way and the fusion model, which is a model that focuses on engagement and collaboration. And Dr. Chuck, Dr. Chuck <laughs> will touch on some <laughs> of the key elements of the fusion model, like the importance of a welcoming and supportive environment, a multidisciplinary team that includes a peer support specialists, recovery language, and much, much more. So here's Dr. Chuck. Thanks, Georgia. First of all, is, is it showing the presenter view or are you just seeing the slides? It's That's the slide. slide. Perfect. Yes. All right. So um, thanks y'all for letting me uh, be able to be here again and, and speak with you. I had a great time talking about safety um, last month. And I've got a couple of slides that will repeat from that, but they're gonna be in a different context related to the fusion model um, since some of the concepts of the fusion model include talking about safety. Um, um, do we have a sense of, and definitely I've got some questions and I'm gonna want you guys to participate in the chat, I hope. Um, so feel free to please do that as we're talking about it. I'm, I'm hoping that I don't have a sense of how many people heard the last talk or uh, versus this one, but we're going to go for it as if most people have, hoping that if you didn't, you could go back and catch a recording or something of that. So going forward, we're going to talk today a little bit about something called the fusion model. And uh, first, we're going to talk about candy. Um, so what does candy have to do with fusion or crisis care for that matter? So my first question, I want to put this in, I hope you guys can either answer out loud or put it in the chat, is what do you think the number one candy in Alaska is? Uh, pick your number one candy sales in Alaska. Um, the I think we've already had to guess, two people have guessed M&Ms so far, and that's they're, they're one of the top five in the country at all times, but I'm just wondering if anybody else has any guesses. Snickers is always top, oh, who, who, mate. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got Reese's, Snickers, Red Vines. I don't know what Red, oh, is it Red Vines like a licorice? Skittles, snow caps. Oh, I don't know snow caps. I'm going to say that for Alaska, Megan either went and looked it up um, or something, but she is right on. It is, it is, uh, it's actually Sour Patch Kids based on a um, candystore.com recent article that came up. But, you know, you have all these candies. Um, in the different commercials, there's the Butterfinger with uh, there, the Skittles. Um, I love the Betty White Snickers commercial. But we, we are there. There is one particular candy that I'm going to use as an illustration today to talk about. And uh, it, it actually often has been listed in the past. I think it was a, when I looked up this for Alaska specific, it was number one in 2020. And it's often in the top two or three of the country in sales with at least in the U.S. of like over seven hundred million dollars a year of candy sales. And that's Reese's Cups. So um, Reese's Cups are here to illustrate a particular story for this. So how anybody remember this commercial, this Reese's commercial? It's old school, like when I was a kid. And uh, the typical thing would be these 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 guys, it's got to be that I'm thinking that like the early 80s with those Walkmans on and they're coming around the corner and distracted and not paying attention to each other. And one person's carrying peanut butter and the other person's carrying a bar of chocolate and they bump into each other. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody remembers um what what is said but the quote is hey you got your you got your chocolate in my peanut butter and you got your peanut butter in my chocolate and um and so basically what happens with that is you get uh this this mixture as they taste it and uh i'm, I'm a side note and i'm glad to say is i'm so glad that nowadays our kids don't have that kind of distraction like walkman's so um going forward i'd like to throw another question to the chat what are things that you associate characteristics of chocolate? So what are some characteristics of chocolate? Creamy, that's great, Rachel. Salted, that's a good one, Brenda. Bitter, it can be bitter, it can be rich. Kate is in heaven. 
sweet, dark. All right. Now give me some characteristics in the chat for peanut butter. What are some things you would associate with peanut butter and the characteristics of it? Sticky, can be creamy, thick and sticky, salty. So I, I like to talk about when I think about peanut butter and, and chocolate, each one of them have their own unique characteristics. And I like both. I mean, I know some people have nut allergies and have to be careful with that or uh, or you may be uh, on low carb or dairy free or whatever with chocolate, but each one of them has their own characteristics and they can be great. However, when you put them together in a Reese's cup, it is this synergy of something that's really, really uh, tasty and it's kind of like better than the whole parts. And so part of my story today and using this story of the Reese's cup that I hope you will remember is this fusion model concept is about taking characteristics and elements that are different from two types of stereotypical models of care and what you can do with that, specifically what you can do with that in crisis care. And so we're going to talk and use the Reese's cup as like an example of fusion in doing that. But in uh, first of all, in order to be able to understand kind of where we're going with this talk, you do have to have a little bit of understanding about where we've been in crisis care. And so I'm sure most of you are fully aware of this, but I'm going to give you a quick story just to kind of summarize and take home. And this only happened a few years ago. Uh, I live in North Carolina, as I said, the, the last time I spoke to you guys, and I have a, I'm going to use the name of a friend called Scott, um, who actually, my wife and I were coming back from some kind of trip, and we got a call, no, we were at home, got a call from our friends, Scott's wife, who was closer friends with my wife, uh, we all kind of gone to high school together, and she was in tears coming back home early from a vacation, because her husband, Scott, was at home, very, very distraught with suicidal thoughts. Um, and actually having ideas of maybe going to the store to get shotgun shells to go in his gun from Dick's Sporting Goods because it, that's how much distress he was having. Um, and they didn't know who to call or what to call. They were scared to call 911 because they didn't want like police to come to their door. Uh, but he was in a lot of distress and they knew I was a psychiatrist, so they called him. And so the good and the bad of that story is that the good answer is that Scott, I was able to talk to him, we got some help, figured out that it was actually a medication side effect that was really distressing and it kind of exacerbated this got him immediately into some care, um, had safety planning done that was uh, really wrapped around and had him supported, um, including handling the gun and those kinds of things, and got the right care approach for what kind of crisis he was going through in the moment. And he's doing great now. We still talk about that. He gave me permission to share this story uh, when I go around and talk about these things. But what it also illustrated is they didn't know who to call or what to do. If Scott had been in a car wreck, they would have called 911. Or if he'd had some kind of major injury and they were near the emergency room, they would have gone to the emergency room on that Sunday. Um, and that is a, a real problem that we've had in this country for a long time, is that we have these standards and these expectations of access and appropriate care when you're in an emergency for all kinds of medical problems and things that happen. But when we have something, a situation like what Scott went through, you know, that's something we're missing. We're missing that access and that care and the knowledge of where to go. So for the past several decades, there have been movements to change this. There's like specialized crisis services keep being developed to um, increase access for uh, people to divert them away from emergency rooms, um, hopefully intervene with law enforcement, not having to be the primary response in a community to mental health uh, and substance use needs that are out there, um, and, to, and to also help divert from jails. Um, and as we uh, have done this ourselves, uh, and we do consulting and go see, uh, go to conferences and crisis conferences where people talk about models and what they do. Um, I tend to see like two major flavors of models. And I go back to the candy thing and, the, and using flavors. Um, and it, it, it doesn't fit all, but it, but it is a pretty good sampling of, of some of the different things. And those two models, uh, I'm going to use kind of two terms. One I'm going to call a medical model and I call that approach. And another I'm going to call the recovery model. So if you think about those terms and going back to the chat, just like we did with the Reese's, if I say medical model of dealing with crisis, what are some of the characteristics and things that you associate with that? Sterile. Any other things? Medication. Yep. Rigid, structured, hierarchical, physical health medication. Any other, any other thoughts? Hospitalization, yep. All expertise located in the supervisor. That's a great one, Thea, great quote. One size fits all, DSM. Now we're up to DSM-5. So 
So those are some really good characteristics. How about um, if you were to describe a recovery model? If we use the word recovery model, what are some characteristics that come to mind? Community-based, engagement, hopeful, hope-filled, readiness, walks with you and community support, including the family, peers, person-centered. Those are great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward with going on talking a little bit more of that. So these two models are not always exclusive. Um, and so I'm painting a, a, a distinct picture of two stereotypes to help make a point going back to this chocolate versus peanut butter infusion concept. But if you want to think about like the medical model, that's the approach that was consistent with the point of view I was taught in medical school. You diagnose an illness, you start an appropriate treatment, um, and those models have led to a development of all kinds of different levels and innovations in crisis care. Um, it's oftentimes performed at kind of larger scales in hospital systems. Um, they um, oftentimes have infrastructure and resources to be able to do uh, cool things with metrics and dashboards and research, um, as well as kind of uh, be able to mesh very well with uh, funders for uh, billing and coding and things like that. And so there's some there's some really positive characteristics that can come along with the medical model. Um, I you know I work at RI obviously, and we started out very much in the recovery model. Um, and that's a, that model, you know, we talk about by being defined and approach, approaching crisis support in kind of a different way, um, where, first of all, from a recovery definition, that even with serious mental illness, treatment involves kind of a focus on finding hope um, and satisfaction and a meaning and a purpose in your life. Um, it pioneered the use of peer coaches in crisis care. Um, it may be even exclusively at some places where peers are the only support in peer run uh, crisis centers. Um, sometimes there can be different levels of care um, in these recovery centers, and they may oftentimes, like was mentioned in the chat, they're in the community or separate from a hospital situation. They may be residential. They could be locked or they may be unlocked, and oftentimes they're decorated different than a typical hospital model. So instead of that sterile, they may look more like a home or like a living room. Um, oftentimes there's a focus on the way that you approach and, and interact with folks with the language and those kinds of things and they may or may not have medications as an option as a part of treatment and so there's some amazing programs just like there are in the medical model around the country that have great stories of connection and hope and improvement um, and so but there are also some characteristics that can be characteristic especially of like purely peer-run or uh, type of centers or residential programs as they might have they might be smaller have less infrastructure um, less ability to have the infrastructure to do metrics and research and quality departments, and they may have challenges being able to prove um, like the value that they add to insurance companies for billing. And so um, many of the models of these that are in the crisis system around the country are often unlocked. Um, but even if they're locked, they may not have the infrastructure to handle like someone who's really trying hard to hurt themselves or to hurt someone else, or who's so confused with reality that they just aren't able in the moment to be safe. So sometimes there can be limits to access to all of that. So if you think about it, there's like these individual characteristics that have positives and there's sometimes limitations. Um, and so you, you end up in this, this barrier. And so crisis now, and as you guys know, and we've been talking about, it's this night new crisis continuum context led by Nashbit and, and adopted and talked about in the National Toolkit from SAMHSA that covers this concept of not just the crisis centers, but all levels of care being equivalent to emergency level services that we have across the country and be able to treat that as an emergency service. An emergency service means you don't have limitations. You have no wrong door, emergency access for everyone in the moment when it happens. And so having that ability to create services that never say no to law enforcement really created this complete change in areas and communities where that's happened. And I'm gonna share with you a real short video to show some of the impact in Maricopa County where uh, Phoenix is in Arizona. So a population of 4 million. And just by being able to do this no wrong door and create access and say yes to everyone, um, as well as them having some other things in place like some call center activity and some mobile support activity has made a big impact. I'm gonna get to this video and just show it, just a quick clip of it. Let's review the impact of the Crisis Now model in Maricopa County, Arizona, fourth most populous county in the U.S. 
In 2017, Maricopa County Police connected more than 23,000 people in a behavioral health crisis directly to crisis care and those people were accepted 100% of the time. The Crisis Now initiatives save the time equivalent of 37 full-time officers, reducing wait times in emergency departments for behavioral health patients by a total of 45 years, saving local hospitals and emergency departments a total of 37 million in avoided costs and losses, freeing them up to help the patients they're designed to treat while routing behavioral health patients to a course of care that's best suited to their needs and reducing Maricopa County's overall healthcare costs by an estimated $260 million, more than twice the cost of Crisis Now services. To learn more about how Crisis Now can make a difference in your community, go to crisisnow.com and download our white paper. So let me get back to my presenter view. So wow, you can see a uh, big time impact um, in terms of that, that uh, model. I mean, you think about in one year, 45 years of emergency department boarding, $260 million in extra costs saved, um, you know, 37 full-time officers being able to be back on the street doing public safety instead of dealing with mental health, um, huge impacts on the community from a business standpoint. But then the question is, you know, let, let's compare to be able to say yes to everyone. Let's look at ways that a medical model versus a recovery model might try to accomplish that. So let's, let's give it a litmus test. And I sort of talked about this when I talked about safety in our last month, but let's say that police uh, law enforcement is being called out in the community for someone who was actively trying to run in front of traffic, throwing punches at the police officers, but obviously was challenged with reality. Might be under the influence of something or it may just be a mental health symptom that just is causing them to not be in touch with reality in the moment. And they bring them into a facility in Arizona and uh, maybe four officers show up at the facility and drop them off. Um, and, and, and might be doing things like trying to run in front of cars or biting the skin off of their arms or, or things like that. And they're on kind of an involuntary commitment for evaluation of their safety. Um, historically, you know, it, the, the way that that's been done in the past is to have the ability to use seclusion and restraint for something like that. If it was really out of control, a lock unit, a lot of medication, different options of that. Uh, of that. And so the, that medical model often approaches that with you know, if you come go to one of those sites, you might see people lined up in chairs, staff behind plexiglass, big bouncer type folks as staff out in the milieu um, that are trained how to do those things. Um, and it's uh, it's also really hard work on the staff in terms of uh, it's really easy to get um, fearful on yourself and dealing with situations like that. So they, they're saying yes, and they're creating access. But if you've got a lot of that going on on a site and everybody's lined up in chairs and blankets and maybe over sedated because of medications given, high rates of seclusion restraint, is that really a place you'd want your family to go? Remember, if that was your family member, um, if, if I were in crisis or most of you were in crisis, you'd want to go pick that recovery model I described. However, if that was your brother or loved one or husband who was in that mode of, of challenge of what was going on with that description I gave you, you wouldn't want the person to go to a site and say, I'm sorry, you're too intoxicated or you're too dangerous. We can't handle you. You're going to need to go out and be on the street and deal with law enforcement. Um, and so if you think about it, it's, 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 this, it's this really tension and balance between um, access and care and the type of care you get that creates a tension in providing this and doing, and doing this. And so at RI, we've been seeing both of those models over the decade, and, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our pendulum and how we've kind of swung back and forth based on the community needs, but based on also wanting to provide care that, that you or your loved one will want. And so I use this silly slide with the safety before last time of this is the classic tension in these crisis receiving centers of running into barriers because you don't meet criteria, you're too dangerous, too sick, too medical, too intoxicated, too something versus it being a place that might say yes, but it's the only place you wouldn't want your loved one to be unless it was your mother, which I love to say that every time I get to do this. So anyway, so let's talk about fusion. What is fusion overall? If, um, you know, I, I kind of shared that story and used the term fusion about melding together um, the uh, chocolate and peanut butter for a Reese's cup. But if you think about the actual scientific chemistry term for fusion, um, I mean, fusion itself could solve the energy for the world. It, it's actually being able to be, bring two uh, pieces of atom together. Um, and the energy that creates is, is the power of our, our sun, it's the power of a star. Um, there's, you know, multi-million dollar with many countries involved in doing research constantly at working on being able to do this. 
However, the reason it's so hard to do is it takes the heat and pressure of a sun of a star to be able to make that chemical reaction happen. And so uh, I have found in our work together and doing this stuff over the years that sometimes it's, it's kind of like that hard to get this recovery model, medical model thing to piece together. Um, and so uh, it's easier said than done. And so I get to see lots of examples of that. And I'll, I'll tell you some about this tension between the medical recovery model. Um, so sometimes, you know, I think both models often have the same goal of better access and better care for folks. But just a lot of times it's don't see eye to eye on how to do it. So I've seen nurses and providers in other situations or in our facilities when we're working on hiring people or I come in to do some supervision or leadership at a, at a site and you might see them frustrated with some of the things of a recovery focus. It's like, I need to make a diagnosis. I need to do these 10 evals. I need to get these people in med pass and pass out their medications. Um, it takes too long to focus on strengths. That's too much. So-and-so, you know, he's got these symptoms. She's got these symptoms. We need to treat them. Um, there's also that research oriented uh, bent sometimes in medical models of like, I need a really strong double prime placebo study to prove all these principles before I'm willing to, you know, guarantee that that, that makes sense. Um, yes, they're logical and yes, they've been considered successful years, but they haven't been studied enough yet. So those are some of the things that you sometimes bump into. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I, I'll give you one more story, like a, a having a new nurse practitioner who's never worked with peers before and not understanding what the role of a peer coach and how powerful for engagement and care and a feeling of hope and empowerment for people walking in and talking to these folks on our staff who have been through that and walked that light. Um, and they don't, they, they might even question about being safe to work with peers on the floor, not understanding how the system works and how that goes. Um, so that's one of the tensions on the medical side. On the recovery world side, I, I mean, I've been to conferences where I, you know, you can just see the anger and the frustration in the view of the problems with the medical world. If you think about it, when we did this talk today and I asked for things medical, not many positive things came up for medical. It mostly had like a negative stereotype about different things. Um, and, uh, and so there's an element sometimes in that recovery world of like, let's, it's a revolution against the hospital insurance machine. And, um, and there can sometimes be a lack of understanding about evidence-based treatment. So I'll give you an example. Um, one of our peer coaches were unbelievably successful in their recovery with methadone as uh, a medication to help them with opiate use disorder, had, uh, you know, work at a full-time job, award-winning peer coach, um, you know, so successful and yet her labels and negative things being said about methadone and myths about that kind of thing, because they came from an abstinence only model and really attacking. And it was painful for that person to hear that stuff going on, even though they knew they were in a really good evidence based practice that was helping them in their recovery path and doing fantastic in their life. So these tensions are part of as your design systems in Alaska it is best to get that Reese's cup and get the best of both worlds and pull in the ability to do all of these things, both, but yet um, there's going to be tension in, in doing that. And you have to pull people together and find common, common reasons and educate people on how it can be done together. And I'm hoping that the rest of this talk is going to really help me be able to uh, continue to show you some examples of ways that we do that and how that goes. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our journey. We opened our first crisis center in the early 2000s in Arizona, and it was a complete recovery model with something called a living room model that we pioneered to decorate it different. It was unlocked. There was no plex. I mean, it was, I'm sure, I'm sorry, it may have been locked. I cannot remember, uh, but it definitely had no plexiglass. It was staffed with a lot of peer support. Um, and in those early days, um, we had a, our own personally developed through uh, lived expertise lens, uh, electronic um, medical record called Recovery Journey. However, things begin to change in Arizona. And as uh, Mercy Care and the access system came into Arizona and said, hey, you if you do crisis services, you're going to have no wrong door. And you're always going to say yes to when law enforcement or people come up to your door and be able to truly like an emergency. And uh, also, you're going to have to be able to have a better electronic health record that can actually bill and work with our billing system because that even though you guys like that system it cannot communicate and do the things you need to be able to do to bill for medicaid and other insurances and so we began this journey of shifting and working on how can we do that and and this this graph kind of tells a little bit of that story 
where in 2014, we were still taking like 57% of our admissions were people coming in um, through law enforcement, either dropping them off voluntarily or involuntarily at our crisis side. But we were still saying no a lot of times. And we were considered a boutique compared to some of the other uh, systems back in that time that were accepting crisis. And that changed in that 2014, 2015. And as pendulums do, we overcorrected. And so in terms of being able to handle some of the situations, because Arizona, Phoenix area has a lot of methamphetamine use. And so you have a lot of mixture of people who come in intoxicated on those stimulants that are super um, easily agitated and might attack people. And, and you, you have to be able to manage that and have the infrastructure to manage that. But I feel like it, and we know, as we were working on being able to build the infrastructure to do that and improve our performance in that, as well as working towards this high, this new electronic health record that was more sophisticated, can do those things, but it didn't have the built-in coaching that our other software did on recovery language and the way that we approach and do things. Different slight changes over time. We added milieu specialists, which are folks oftentimes with lived experience, but who have a uh, training to be able to manage seclusion and restraint in a emergency setting if something happened where someone just started like sometimes happens just immediately punching someone or slamming their head up against the wall or things like that you have to be able to keep them safe in the short term and so as we did that we saw our pendulum swing and maybe pulling away from being as pure power and so uh, working with being able and to see this as our numbers are going up, our percentage of law enforcement, as we do that, our crisis center is being used in serving thousands of more people per year, as you can see in this graph. We worked on how can we pull this thing back in the middle and be able to still say yes and, ha and have a no wrong door approach, but also pull back to our roots of making sure that it's that kind of care that your loved one will want and not lose that capacity of peer power practices and being really engaged and connecting to people. Um, and so we, we called this term fusion and the fusion model. And it basically is this combination of no wrong door, being able to say yes and do that with everyone, as well as create a care and, and um, caring situation that you would want for yourself or your loved one if they were in crisis. So now this fusion model has kind of two definitions. It's this this tension between the medical model and the recovery world, and it plays out in the function of doing these two things well and fusing it together in crisis care. So as you remember in the SAMHSA guidelines that I shared for safety, when I was just talking about one of the guidelines being safety and security for all staff, some other ones are key essential crisis practices that we feel like we can't accomplish at RI in a good way if we don't have that balance, because it talks about addressing recovery needs significant use of peers, trauma-informed care practices, and really using them, um, having the performance of being able to have safer suicide care, um, and then being able, but you still have to be able to coordinate with law enforcement and emergency services as you do that. And so you guys saw this slide when I was talking about safety. We developed a, a key, a, a set of four keys based on Disney's four keys that they use with their employees to create this fun family experience so that our employees could use it to drive forward some independence and empowerment and knowing how they can think through ways to provide a safe um, experience that we call the RI way um, of safety and then engagement, peer power and performance. However, it's not just keys in a circus uh, in a circle as we talked about um, last time it's it's a it's rungs on a ladder. And so it's really important that a staff member understands, you know, safety is always first, but after safety that I'm bring, I'm coming in with engagement, focusing on being in character and engaging with the people I'm serving and my teammates. Then I'm going to focus on bringing, now that I'm here and I'm present, the next step, everything in the tier of how I'm thinking about what my role is per day is being peer powered in the way that I treat the people that I'm serving. And so I'm going I'm to share you some, share with you some of the elements of that. And then finally, performance. And that's the efficiencies and things like that. You, if you let that take more importance than engagement and being peer power, it's really easy to, um, for people to feel like they're being processed and that they're a widget in a factory as they go through the crisis continuum. However, it is, so, it is important to maximize it as much as you can, not at the sacrifice of being engaged, not at the sacrifice of the way you treat people. But it is important because it creates less frustration, it makes things more efficient, creates less waste, creates better value for what you do. So we're going to go through some different elements in those three things. And obviously, I'm going to 
I did a whole talk on safety, so I'm not going to go through that again. So let's go into engagement, which is our second key and rung on the ladder that we focus. And I'm going to give you some key things to think about as you guys are developing your system and thinking about a way to um, support that. I'm going to give you some thoughts and ideas in both training and tools to use. So the thing about engagement, we talk about engaging with our guests and being in character with them, which means you, at, a, at a provider level in a receiving center, or whether you're on a mobile team or whether you're on a calls, is do you have that caring tone and does the person feel like you actually see them as a person and that you're engaged with them and connected? Um, and that's a really important element. And it's so hard in emergency care, whether it's medical or physical, it's a, it's a burnout. It's really easy to get burned out and people can lose that, that caring as they're going through the process every day and doing that. So having things in place with both training and supports that help build that up. And so we talk about always think about giving our guests and our community and our teammates the easy button with each other. Try to create choice and easy paths that allow that to happen. And so within our team, we have engagement within our team. We talk about, you know, when you walk down the halls with staff members, you should have your eyes open and look at Georgia in the eye and say, hey, Georgia, how are you doing? It's good to see you today. Um, and, and that kind of atmosphere environment, that's a thing that they coach at really high customer service places is hiring people that have that kind of persona and then hoping and then expecting and having a culture that you bring that to work with your team and with the people that you serve. And then, like I said, engagement in the community is really important, too, because a crisis center is the hub of needing to engage with assertive community treatment teams, outpatient units, emergency departments, inpatient hospitals that they connect and collaborate with, families, uh, community stakeholders, churches. Um, I can go on and on. I'm probably skipping different things, but it's it's a very important to be that, that key hub and give the easy button to the community that you say, yes, you're there and you're there to help people in the community. We talk about engagement language. And so one of the things that we really focus on is, is teaching and leading, uh, not by being language police to each other, but just having leaders and, and at new HR training and things like that emphasize the, the types of words that we use. Um, and so we think about an actual language. Talk about. So we call people guests instead of patients or clients um, to emphasize the importance of caring. Um, we created this process where we created kind of the top typical 10 questions that guests ask in our crisis centers so that we could create a process of a way to, to give our staff tools so that we don't give inconsistent answers that might make someone feel like they're being um, lied to or not being trusted in that. And so we worked on that. We worked on do with clinical guides for our nurses and our providers and our clinician, licensed clinicians, so that even though there's things that we have to do in crisis, how can you do those things in a collaborative person-centered way and get the things that are required done, but give that person as much choice as possible and as much participation? Um, and I think, I can't remember, I think it was Thea that said the thing about the physician as the expert. It's really important that in this crisis situation, you create templates of work and modes of work where you've got two experts. You've got, you've got the staff that's the expert in their subject matter expertise, and then you've got the guest who's the expert on themselves, and that you're working together in that crisis situation to come together with a solution that makes sense, that both people feel uh, works well, um, and that there's choice there. And then finally, we talk about uh, concurrent and collaborative documentation, and that is that we actually uh, train our staff to get their note done when they see the person in the moment, but also share the note with the person that they're serving as they're doing it so that it's they agree with the wording. They understand what, what the staff is thinking, and they can give their viewpoint into their own medical record about what they uh, do. Sometimes this meets resistance about, oh my gosh, isn't that going to take a lot of time? And it actually doesn't take a lot of extra time. And when you finish that note, right when you see that person, it's a lot better than people that tend to like leave their notes to the end of the day and try to do them all at the end of the day. They also get capture and improve the ability to do better collaborative care and person-centered care. And I would argue that it invests and engages the person better as well in their care and therefore is going to probably have an increased chance of improving their crisis faster uh, for the majority of people. We uh, do special training called AIDIT that does acknowledge, introduce, duration, explain, and thank you. So this is a mode of training that we go through and give to our staff about the way to introduce themselves to people and explain what they're doing and why they're doing. It's both an engagement tool 
And I think it's an important trauma-informed care practice of setting expectations, especially for people who may have been traumatized in previous crisis situations so they know what's going on. I talked about the top 10 questions. So we created this process called VIP as an acronym for staff to use as a mechanism to handle some of these answers to top 10 questions. When do I get to leave? When do I get, why can't I smoke here? Um, when do I get to see the doctor? Um, and it's being able to validate and reflect their uh, statement, identify strengths. I'm so glad that you're focusing on what you need to do to get out of here. Let's, and then, and then can, is it okay if we plan together and talk about what brought you here on this involuntary commitment so we can develop a plan that we all feel good about that's safe uh, and is going to help you accomplish your goal. And, and so it's it's using this format to, to train people to not just say no or I don't know or give different answers. It's it's actually connecting with the person and going through these steps makes a big difference in people feeling cared for and a part of their treatment. And then finally, we talk about just the actual overall environment. And so we try to create environments that don't have plexiglass, that are open, um, that are engaging, that have colors that are nice, flooring that is nice. Um, as much as possible, try to not have rows and have circular chairs and, and ways for people to see each other and connect with people and encourage our staff. You can see this little itty bitty island. There's not room for a ton of staff to be behind it. So what does that mean? Where do they have to be? That means they have to be out in the environment working with guests and being engaged with guests. So Thinking about how you design the structure can have a big difference in how much your guests are getting connected to by staff versus the staff being back behind a computer screen. So mobile islands that, that can move the computers around when you're doing assessments and things where you have to have the computer, continue to develop our technology so you can do things on tablets and be mobile um, it are all really cool things to improve engagement on the floor. And then finally, some tools. Um, we created this engagement scale. We're doing it on tablets and piloting it in, in some of our sites. And the goal is to be able to connect it, even though it's anonymous and not part of the medical record, we're collecting the medical record number. We're asking these three questions on a Likert scale. And my number one question I care about right now is I'm a partner, excuse me, I feel cared for by the staff on a scale of one to four and getting that result and, and doing it each time per shift. And by being connected to medical record numbers over time, we'll also be able to look at demographics and are we... Um, are we are different uh, demographic groups feeling as cared for as other groups? Are different shifts doing better jobs than other shifts? Are different sites getting higher scores or lower scores? And can we dive down and find out what are our staffs doing really well? And where do we have focal points where we're not doing well with people feeling cared for? And we need to dive in and work on. So having tools that measure engagement are can be a really important thing in being successful with that. I'm going to head into just a little bit of touch on peer power. What is peer power? By definition, I think of peer power as kind of two or three things. One is having a peer culture and a peer voice in the, the essence of your company so that it's not just about using peer support, but it's about peer support being an integral part of everything at all levels of leadership, your board, um, middle management, those types of things. And that is part of co-design that there are peer powered practices that not just the peers do, but all team members do it. So I'm gonna share with you how we classify our peer powered practices. And then finally having kind of tools and systems that help measure and support being peer powered. So when we think about peer powered practice, we focus on five major groups that we train and want our staff to know about when they think about what are the peer powered practices. So this is not just for peer support. This is for a doctor, for a, a clinician, for a, a milieu specialist, for a nurse. And it's collaboration, so doing things with people, not to them. Strengths focused, so when people are in crisis, we're not just focusing on what's wrong in the crisis, but also empowering them. What have you done in the past that's helped you in situations like this? How can we help you access that? Um, what what can, what are the things that matter to you on that, and how can you use your strengths to deal with this crisis? Very important element versus just focusing on what's wrong. Whole person wellness is an approach that talks about thinking about meaning and purpose, not just diagnosis and symptoms. I cannot tell you how many times a crisis situation is relieved in a day, not because we started an antidepressant, even though the antidepressant might be a good tool in the long run for depression, but because we engaged and worked on connecting that person with their supports and they felt safe, like they knew they were going to be able to work with their family over the next couple of weeks. 
um, while they were working in their outpatient follow-up to help target some of the symptoms that were going on. Um, it involves looking at social determinants like housing and finances and having food and, and working on your health and those types of things. Um, trauma-informed care is a big piece of, of, of this element in our peer power practice, and it's about understanding that so many people, um, both that work for us and the people that we serve that have their own trauma that they've gone through, and how does that make us and affect us interact with different stimuli that we face, and how do we create systems, environments, and interactions that minimize the chance of activating that and are inclusive to all kinds of diverse populations so that they get um, that feeling of being cared for. And then finally, like I talked about, even if you have the infrastructure to be able to use force such as seclusion restraint or emergency medicines in an imminent danger situation, you need to have practices in place that make sure that it is only at an emergency level only. And so we have things in place that we do, like reviewing all those things with video, having a peer review of it, um, tracking tools and data on what happened, processing. We find that if you don't do that, it becomes really easy to do seclusion restraint a lot more. Um, and so you always want to think of that, even if you have the capacity to do it, as a treatment failure. And it would be considered the same. It's like having life preservers or parachutes. You never want to use them. You want to be able to have them in case you need them in an emergency. But anytime you have to use them, it's a failure. So that's how we look at it. Is that we don't want our staff to feel bad if it happens. Um, we want them to feel confident and secure in how to do those techniques. But we always want it to be as a last resort only in an emergency. And that we go back and look at it, that we really were engaged in using peer power practices on the forefront. And still, there was an emergency that we uh, had that use. So... When I think about a uh, peer role, it's such an important part of driving that voice, um, driving a voice on the floor in the unit, engagement with the staff, uh, but it also is important in our leadership level, in your executive teams, in middle management, um, and then having tools. So I'm gonna show you a really cool tool, just a video real quickly of a tool that we developed called um, the Organizational Tool for a Peer-Powered Workplace. And we're presenting it as a poster at National Council um, in another couple of weeks, but it basically it measures these elements in like a toolkit for the three categories I mentioned, peer voice, and you get a peer culture, you get an average score for that out of five. It's got elements of the peer power practices that I just mentioned and measures, and you can measure yourself in an individual or group way about how well your organization is doing with this. Um, and then the final piece is the tools and systems that you have. And it ends up with a final process of giving you um, an overall score, and then we'll connect to recommendations of resources and infrastructure um, and consulting options and things like that that can help you improve um, your ability to be peer powered in the way you do it. So finally, I'm going to switch over um, to talking about performance and wrap up um, in the last few minutes of the talk. But before we get to that, I just want to show you one more thing related to peer powered. I, I talked about engaged environments. It's also um, another part about these environments is, is creating them so that they can enable peer powered concepts. So if you see the walls aren't harsh and dark, they're, they're warm, welcoming, there's murals painted on the wall, there's messages and words of recovery actually in these, you, if you got really close up in the water, you can read like hope and empowerment and you can do this and all kinds of encouraging messages and we'll see yes, go over there and, and look and read that stuff at different times of their stay. Um, sunlight and openness and, and, and warmness to create uh, kind of that trauma care informed environment so it enables those practices. And then as I showed you in the slides a month ago from a safety perspective, it's really wide open and you can see all, this, all the guests being served so that you have continuous observation on these retreat units while you're also in that trauma and fair informed environment. So as we go into performance, that's where we talk about like dashboards, tools, measuring things. I already showed you how you can use performance elements to measure your sense of safety, your sense of engagement, your sense of peer power. But it also becomes really important for operational things too. So you want to measure like how long a guest has to wait before they get to see their appear. So at what time do they show up at the door? Do they get to see a, a staff member? At what time does it take to get orders and get them onto the unit? Um, what's your number of people that get sent out for the, to the emergency room for a particular medical issue? And are you tracking and owning that and working on it? Um, those kinds of things make a difference to um, the experience that the guest has in terms of it being efficient, not having to wait as long, getting access to care as quickly as possible. 
Um, and it also probably increases the chances that you're going to have higher quality uh, connection and doing all the things you need to do to provide good care for someone in crisis. You don't need to know anything about this slide other than it's just a workflow that we use in training for all of our staff to work together to think about from peer welcome to triage to assessment to presentation time to the evaluation to the plan. These are all the things that have to be done. And then we break it up into, you know, kind of what's your role and what are all the different things if you're a nurse that are that you're doing during those roles. So we kind of do that breakdown of the different things, including, you know, how can you engage as a nurse? Uh, but what are the to do's that you have to do, too? And then, you know, if we have something that's a high acuity program, what's your role in that? And so having um, clearly defined performance roles of what your expectation is is important. It's also important to, in order to say yes to people, you have to be able to deal with this issue of medical quote clearance. Um, and so you, from a performance perspective, you have to have the right infrastructure for medications, tools for medical evaluation, so that you can assess and safely care for people who ha might have problems with uh, withdrawal from substances that, they, that need medications to keep them safe while they're in your care. Um, maybe they have uh, blood pressure problems or diabetes problems. And so you have to have some basic medications that can help with those kinds of things while they're with you. Um, and then processes to make sure that if they have home meds, how can you help them use them while you're, they're with you and things like that. So it takes medical infrastructure to do that. And you also have to coordinate with emergency departments so that you don't oversend. So for example, in our sites, we keep a number of somewhere between five to 6% of people of folks who come to our crisis centers throughout their whole stay go to the emergency department for a specific issue. And over half of those come back. So you're thinking out of 100 people, 95 to 94 of them stay at our unit and never have to go out for, quote, medical clearance and are safe. And then a small percentage do. And then out of that percentage, half of them come back once that issue has been taken care of or dealt with. Also, it's really important to create inclusiveness and in care for substance use. Um, so thinking about being able to manage people that show up intoxicated and how you do that safely medical problems that come along with substance use problems so that we can help connect and support those people because oftentimes those things don't get addressed if they're not an emergency and an emergency room visit, helping them manage withdrawal, um, and then having that recovery focused treatment and follow up approach. So one of the cool things that we've been doing is, at, on our campus is becoming a, a crisis hub in the spoke of the opioid treatment world in some of our centers. And so putting the infrastructure in your crisis centers to be able to do inductions for opioid use disorder, uh, give out harm reduction measures like um, uh, naloxone for people who have that risk, connecting people to care and using peer navigators and bridgers to get them connected to um, medication treatment when they choose that as an option because it is a best practice for opiate use disorder. Um, and all these things built in, again, create more people that you can say yes to. Um, a, a common thing that would happen five or 10 years ago would be people would come in on 100 milligrams of methadone, but they would be there for challenges with suicidality. And if we didn't have the infrastructure to be able to continue them on their methadone while they're there, they're going to go through major, major uncomfortable withdrawal that could, that's risky and not good for them to go through. So by building in the infrastructure medically to be able to offer that to them while we're helping them work on their suicidality, um, it helps them, create again, have access to care and not get sent out and run into barriers. And then finally, we talk about, you know, this crisis now is all about the call centers, mobile support teams, crisis receiving centers. But it truly, as we evolve this and we have those emergency care things established, it allows for you to then shift infrastructure and resources on all that money saved by having this stuff in place and working well to all of the preventative and post-crisis uh, needs that are part of a campus of connection that help people connect and work on all the things that um, create to a whole health wellness. So as I wrap up my talk, I'm going to I've got enough time. Perfect. 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 I get to show you my video um, before we go into the question phase. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of a story here as I tell you this. So this is a clip from a movie called The Founder, which is about um, Ray Kroc and McDonald's um, and his vision when he went out to California, I think in the 50s and met these McDonald's brothers that were running this new fangled fast food restaurant thing he had never seen before. And he was so fascinated ab about it because he had been a milkshake salesman lately and go traveling salesman around and, and went through all the hassle. And the movie showed how he would go to diners and have to wait, get the wrong food at these takeout uh, things where he would have the uh, personal roller skates bringing it to his window. 
Um, it would take time, food would be cold or it'd be wrong. Um, there was also in one of those scenes, like teenagers hanging outside, smoking cigarettes, and it was kind of a, looks like a kind of a shady environment. And then he gets these milk, these brothers that say, Hey, we want to order like five milkshake machines. Nobody even ordered more than one ever before. And so he just had to go see it in person. So he's gone through these problems. He's showing up at this center. And this is kind of what he sees when he shows up. Welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? Yeah, give me a uh, hamburger and French fries and a Coca Cola. That'd be 35 cents, please. Ready? 15 cents is your change. Here you are. What's this? Your food. No, no, no. I just ordered. And now it's here. You sure? All right. Where are the, uh, you know, silverware and the plates and everything? You just eat it straight out of the wrapper and then throw it all out. All right. Okay. Where do I eat it? In your car? At the park? At home? Wherever you like. Okay, 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 thanks. So as you can as you can kind of see, that's uh um that was Ray Kroc's vision of oh my gosh, this is something um, you know, and and however you feel about Ray Kroc or not, he did take that vision and expand it so that it became like the the industry leading innovation of how to do fast food across the world. Um, but the cool thing about that video and why I like to show it is, you know, obviously we we talked about where crisis has been. And and my friend Scott, you know, was was terrified about dealing with that emergency situation and what what access he could have. And I hope that as you guys in Alaska are working and, and taking the time to learn and figure out how to do this, that you think about these concepts of the fusion model, find ways to increase and encourage its implementation in all the phases of the care that you do in your crisis work so that guests who come in and who are in crisis almost have that, like, I can't believe I'm getting this experience of like, you're going to treat me this way. This is great. I get access to, to this service. That's great. Um, and I get, uh, and I actually, it helps me with my crisis and move forward. And it's, it's so innovative. It's silly that we don't have that moving forward in a better way across our country, but it is uh, doable and it can be done to pull these things together. And so I hope that that video would just be a memory of encouragement of, you know, there was a time where that that McDonald's model wasn't something that people foresaw that could be done in that way as a solution and innovation but can be. We just have to put those things into place and follow things that have been shown to work. So thanks for time with all that. And I'll look forward to talking about questions for the next 30 minutes. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Chuck. And, and just so everyone knows, this is open question time. You're welcome to unmute and ask questions, or if you feel more comfortable putting things in the chat, please do so. You're welcome, Summer. Yes, Thea. Um, I. I think like I'm a little bit back at the very beginning of your your presentation where we were talking about the chocolate and the peanut butter and kind of the characteristics of the medical model and the recovery model. And just thinking about, um, I mean, what I think about the medical model is that if you have a broken leg or if you have cancer, 
you absolutely want that model. Um, and, and it's very effective in those situations. In a psychiatric or behavioral health crisis, it, does, it doesn't have all the tools, like you've said. And I guess, um, I think one of the things that comes up a lot is the importance of the environment. And obviously you've talked a lot about that today um, and the ways in which the environment where we deal with kind of physical health crises is adapt, you know, like an emergency room is adapted to those emergencies, whereas yeah. the, the model that you have is adapted to the type of crises that, you know, that we're trying to address. And that, I, I guess I'm, maybe it's more of a comment. I'm just thinking more about that as, as your presentation unfolded no, today. You. And just, yeah, just curious what your, I don't know, just maybe no, I'm just I, sharing I think, a comment. Thank you for pointing that out. I, I think it's so important as you guys are designing stuff. I, I think our environment is, it makes, Thinking about the environment and what is it like um, is so huge. I, there's very few emergency rooms, emergency departments that are not that are that are going to be designed in a way that's going to be ideal for helping people with mental health or substance use challenges uh, in in a good way. It's the it's not just and it's not just the physical environment. It's just the emergency department culture is just a whole different thing. Um, and and when you're in crisis with behavioral health, now some emergency departments do have specialty people who come into the emergency department and some of them have special units, but I have found that like that tension on the fusion that I described, it's really hard in that medical model to fully get into doing that warm living room connectivity, um, those kinds of things. However, on the other end, if you don't build in some of that infrastructure, if you can't have an option to do certain medications, for example, then you're going to have people who are uh, challenged with psychosis too much to be safe in a unit um, or to not be able to get better potentially, even though that's not the only tool that you can use to, to target psychosis or deal with conditions that have psychosis. But somebody could be in a legal situation if they're in withdrawal from alcohol or benzodiazepines, for example. Um, and then also people oftentimes need medications for their medical problems while they're there. And here's a huge one. Almost every facility now has to be smoke free. So your number one medication that you have to have in your in your crisis centers is nicotine replacement patches and lozenges. So um, that, that's that's super key. Um, and then, uh, but but that, that's an important uh, thing, Thea. Is is you have to have some, and that's why I call it fusion. Is you want the chocolate and the peanut butter and get the best of both and put them together. Um, and that's that's what we're aiming for. Is how do you accomplish that? And it's it's tough. I will also say in that that tension part, you you have to recruit and hire um, for when you're looking at medical staff, nursing, doctors, psychiatric nurse practitioners, things like that. You have to talk about in the hiring. This is what crisis care is like. This is how if you're going to do that fusion model concept, this is hey, you're working. We're working with peers, and it is part of our culture, and this is how we do it. So we want you to understand about not being, uh, this isn't run like an inpatient unit. We work to help people get home as quickly and as possible, as long as it's safe. We work on connecting with them and letting them have choice. We're not the bosses. And then also there's going to be peers in your treatment team and your daily rounds that are going to speak out and voice and be a, a big part of the team. And so you have to have people who understand that or are willing to learn about, about it. I was just, I learned a lot from just, I didn't, I had done a little bit of peer work uh, back in 2009 when I started working at RI, but I have gained so much more um, understanding of the power of that. And so it's building that into the system. Brenda, are you calling in staff who are off shift or on call if you get more and more? That's a great point. Um, uh, uh, Brenda, uh, yes, oftentimes. So let's say you have a base staffing pattern and you get uh, either really, really full or you start getting super more higher levels of acuity. Um, we've actually been working on tools to develop called staffing calculators that then have modifying factors of um, high acuity things that could increase that. So anytime you have a, a guest who needs to be temporarily on like a one-to-one -one, um, maybe they maybe they struggle with swallowing things, or maybe they struggle with randomly just hitting people, or maybe they're a real big falls risk and they need somebody to be right beside them until that's improved, oh, or maybe it's a chronic condition and the whole time they need there, they need somebody there uh, with them. So if you have enough of that, it's ideal to be able to have some kind of infrastructure in place to be able to staff up if you need to. The smaller a unit is, 
that has less staff, the harder it is. The larger a unit is, the more chance that you can pull, uh, that you're going to have a, just a bigger ecosystem um, and economy of scale to be able to do that. So those are, but but yeah, there are times where you're, if things are more um, acute, you have to do that. So we have like, I, I think in my safety talk, I showed you that safety assessment tool. And one of the things we had were recommendations of the amount of staffing you need for certain levels of acuity that you're going to be dealing with. Have you seen maybe any any change in what might be more often kind of those medical model like inpatient psychiatric treatment as as RI and others in Arizona have really rolled out kind of this peer approach? Have you seen any of those strategies sort of trickle up to that inpatient setting or are those still operating kind of in the more more traditional way? Thank, thank goodness, Becky, I've seen some. Yeah, over the years, I've seen some improvement in that. Um, I, it, I wouldn't say it's universal, and I still think we've got a long, long way to go to have what I talked about today as like a, a pervasive thing. But like when I went to the American Association of Emergency Psychiatry Conference um, year before last, there were two or three presentations built into that. And this is like out of emergency rooms and emergency psychiatric stuff of the use of peer support and recovery-oriented techniques um, that were part of that. And so that was really nice to see that. That's a very medical conference uh, that does a lot of stuff on like medications for agitation and medications for acute suicidality and stuff like that. But they also had these pieces and these elements of, of, of culture and the way you treat people um, and, and, and a reflection on that. So um, you're also seeing more and more hospitals bring peers into emergency departments as a, as a like a, you know, as a mixed thing. Um, and, and again, you still have the person, I would say it takes a lot of support and allies and work to support peer staff who are getting immersed into that medical model if the overall organization doesn't have peer culture and voice in it, um, but which is very different from working in our organization, for example. But you are seeing that happen more and more. Um, and usually the stories that you hear at conferences when it's successful is people realize the impact that peers make on, on changing the engagement and the connectivity and uh, um, improving the rates of, of, of people connecting into care and feeling like that they had somebody they could relate to and what that did. But I still think there's a ton of tension in, a, in it being um, safe in those organizations and understood about the role of what a peer and peer power practices for all people can be. Dr. Chuck, I had a kind of a random question. I can't remember if you'd answered this previously at, a, at the last webinar, but, you know, just talking about the expectation of customer service type relations for all employees, is the, are those expectations also, in addition to being modeled top down, are they also like included in job descriptions or kind of annual performance reviews for all employees within your centers? Yeah, there's categories of that in our annual performance review uh, about that capacity. Um, and then, you know, like I said, that scale, that engagement, engagement tool, as we really get that rolled out and are using it, it's going to be extremely powerful. It's so much more in the moment than a, than a satisfaction scale um, because it's like it's each shift. You're asking those three important questions and especially that question of feeling cared for. Um, and uh, I think it's got a chance in the, in the other I do in the call center. Same thing, putting a measurement in of how well was your distress level when you first called versus not done. Um, I think staff getting that feedback and seeing improvements in it helps with like burn and helps that connectivity and like wanting to, not because of, I'm not getting, it's not that I don't want to get in trouble for getting low caring scores because wow, that person felt like or And when we get letters, a lot of times at our crisis sites, we'll be hanging up letters that people sent about their experience and their story with us. That is so powerful to get that feedback and have that. Um, and that that might be one of my favorite ones of all is, is those kinds of stories um, in, in terms of creating that feedback. But I, going back to the hiring, I think you have to hire for it. I think you have to set expectations of this is the expectation of engagement that we want from it. 
And then I think you have to train it. And so training those tools, like the aid of how to communicate with people, uh, training the top 10 and how to, how to validate and, and have that language, um, supporting those language things in what you do every day, all those elements. So it's, it's like this hiring, training, tools and systems that you use. And then, and then hopefully that it's just part of your, you, you, over time, it just becomes part of your culture. But if your leaders don't care about that as much as they care about how many people you see or how, you know, what kind of performance widget mattered. So that's why we make it the second key. It's like, you've got to come into character each day and, and be able to do that. Did that answer the question, Megan, for what you wanted or was there any other elements of that? No, that's super helpful. I just thinking having worked previously in the metal, medical model and other settings where it's, there is sometimes that discrepancy between what we say and then kind of what accountability what standards you're held to and in annual process improvement and employee yeah. feedback. So thank you. Um, I think that was a question in the chat. Um, how is follow-up being handled? So it, it, it depends um, on the on the site, Rebecca, but usually um, it is uh, done through either our peer staff on the site who then calls in and does things related to that or it's done by um, sometimes we have like a warm line staff that does a warm line and then they also take care of doing some follow-up calls. Um, I'm seeing, um, you know, at uh, in Atlanta, when I also work at Behavioral Health Link, one of the things that we're developing is a follow-up module to guide call centers that do follow-up calls or mobile teams that do follow-up calls to help guide best practices and what you want to check in on, how progress of how things work. Did you use elements of your safety plan? Did it work or not? Do we need to adjust your safety plan? Those kinds of things in, the, in those follow-up modules are, are important, but it's really clear in suicide care that uh, close follow-up, connective follow-up, and making sure that people get to their next step is an important part of this crisis continuum. It's a huge, huge part, and we've got a long ways to go to keep getting it better. And I think peers can be a huge part of that, and there's lots of areas where um, Medicaid is supporting now for certain people that qualify for it, peer um, support services for the first 30, 40, 45 days from their crisis in intervention to help them get to social security to fill out paperwork or to help them get to social services to do something or to get to an appointment and make sure that they get connected to those next steps too. So for people who need that level of support to stay in, um, in their recovery path, that's a really uh, great tool that we're seeing good benefits from. And I was talking about that campus of care with the opioids thing huge impact in the number of people that are that make it back for their outpatient pop appointment from the crisis center when they've got connection to a peer bridger. Yes, Brenda? Would you suggest that there be some coordination of which entity's peer is going to follow the person or be doing the majority of the follow-up? Because we were kind of discussing in Fairbanks, if we have a crisis call center, they have a peer that wants to follow up. Then we have a mobile crisis team that might have a peer that wants to follow up. Then we might have a stabilization center that has a peer that wants to guide along. And, you know, suddenly the person has, you know, four phone calls every three days. <laughs> How have you dealt with that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I would say that, again, going back to thinking about those concepts of being peer powered, Brenda, probably that you want to get the opinion of what the person being served wants and, and what works for them. Because there may be somebody who's tickled to get four calls, even though it's probably might be inefficient. Um, but but like you said, for somebody who that's too much is saying, well, who would you prefer? You know, if, they, if you can set it up that way in your system so that they can have a choice, that's great. Um, I think a lot of times it keeps getting moved on to once someone is connected to the next step in their path that maybe they take over from there. And in the long run, I think it's super ideal if somebody is going to go back to community and get connected into some type of uh, program, whether it's an outpatient program or a residential program or just some support services and ancillary resources that whoever is working in that area, um, if you can connect some kind of follow-up system so that they're connecting with them and bridging that and welcoming them in and then taking that that lead over, that's even that's even like the best. And, and I think the use of technology is a great way to consider that. So thinking about like in your crisis centers, um, 
having a setup so that maybe somebody a, a telescreen so that then you just develop a real quick thing that if you're going to have an appointment next week that they can get that somebody from that center can get on for like a minute and say hey i'm i'm becky and uh, i'm the one that'll be doing your intake next week or one of us will be doing your intake but i just want to say hey welcome to our site we're really excited about seeing you when you come here here's some things to know about da 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 I think things like that are really powerful in that next step. And we need to get better at doing that so that it's not just you get care when you're in crisis and then you leave and you're right back in the middle of everything. Again. And that's where safety and crisis planning is super important too, because you can, before you walk out of that environment, you can formulate and role play when certain stressors and warning signs and things are going to come back that I have to deal with. What can I control? What works for me? Going back to that strengths focus, what have I done in the past that worked? And how can I plan ahead to have that in my plan of that's how I'm going to react to it and who are my supports and resources that I can go to and use. And then if those things don't work, what are my crisis options if I still need them, um, if that doesn't work um, so that I can stay safe. But it's, it's, that's a really important part of this pathway. And it does connect to your follow-ups too. Thank you. I was actually wondering about, um, so I know the Veterans Crisis Line, they send letters. Um, this is for the Veterans and Military Crisis Line. Um, they will go ahead and send carrying contact letters. And then we also do at the VA uh, carrying contact letters for our high-risk flag veterans 12 months um, currently and in 12 months after deactivation of flagging. Um, and it has been helpful we, we've shown that. However, what about hospital follow-up? Um, anybody who has left a hospital not wanting to engage, um, has there been anything out there for that follow-up? If they're, not, you know what I mean, continuously, chronically going to the hospital in acute care, sending letters maybe for resources or things like that? I, one of the things that, I, that I've heard about that I love, um, we have not implemented at our place, I haven't had the infrastructure to get it going, but I have seen of some smaller sites that have done it is carrying cards, um, sending, you know, like actually having a, and it's not just a generic letter, it's something from like maybe a peer who worked with somebody and said, I just wanted you to know, I really um, hope you're doing well and sending it at a particular time. And and I've we've um, there are stories of people and how that impacted them to to get it. Um, I, I think with the caring letter thing, you just have to be careful that it's impactful and it's not just a to do thing. Which is one of the reasons, like when you think about safety planning, having um, with like Craig Bryan's response crisis response plan format, you don't pull out a form. It, it's a it, you let the person write on their own. Uh, you know, card, what they, what is in their plan, because there's something connecting and engaging about that that is meaningful to you. So if you're going to do a caring letter, I definitely recommend that you try to make sure that it has a, an ability to have something personalized or engaging in it that it's meaningful. Otherwise, it's just like when we call a customer service line and the person says the right stuff, but it's in a monotone, like not caring kind of thing. And it doesn't really mean anything to you. So I think whatever you do, you want it to have an ability to be something that has that engagement. And I, I think those carrying cards can be really powerful, especially if you can identify higher risk considerations. And that that's where, though, that's the group of people that I think really benefit from having actual people, peer bridgers uh, going out after the follow-up and being checking in with them in person if they're difficult to engage, um, if they'll allow it, if somebody will allow them, let that be a part of what they work on. Um, especially if they have limited supports and limited resources out there. And I'll say one more thing on that that we didn't cover is that that's just, that's also reflects the importance of, uh, we still don't do it as good as we need to. And that's bringing in family and supports as part of the crisis care. Um, and that, because that's, I mean, if, if it's healthy and good supports for the person, um, that, that can be the most, one of the most powerful like connectors in that intermediary step of coming out of crisis and then the next step that you do. Um, and that's um, oftentimes in our systems, we don't make it easy for family and supports to get involved in those next steps, in the safety planning, in the connectivity of next things, in family education. 
So I think that's a, that's a really probably something we need to keep creating the structure and the infrastructure to maximize that. I do agree on the like veterans crisis line. Um, I haven't seen the letter, but like just a regular letter for us, the Alaska VA, it's a postcard and it's a different postcard and it's an Alaska veteran artwork. And we do, you know, a competition and it's personalized, you know, so that we can make sure that it is a personal every single month. Um, however, that is also dependent on the funding sources and yeah, things like yeah. that. And you know what I mean? We're just, we're VA, so smaller population, things like that. But um, I, I was interested in bigger population, how we could expand on it and how it, does it work and things, like, how it would work. Um, I'm curious um, about some of the performance pieces that you shared. Um, I guess mm -hmm. you know you, you showed some different screen captures of some different tools. Um, you know, did did our eye kind of build all of those? Are there any tools that are you know supported by the state or by the ASO? And then in terms of what happens with that data, is for the most part, is it kept? kind of internal for internal process improvement? Or are there things that Mercy Care or others really care about that you're kind of regularly reporting out more broadly? My answer to that is yes, Becky, all of that. <laughs> we, there's a lot, so much of the stuff I showed you is our homegrown, like the engagement scale, that peer power tool, we're sharing it and it's gonna be open source um, uh, starting as, as soon as we launch our final model over the next, couple of weeks right before National Council, you got to see a video that's going to be in the poster and people will have a QR scan where they can get on it and you can use it for a county or a state or an individual provider could use it to rate themselves and look at what areas they are strong and what areas they've got weaknesses in to improve that on that performance. But that's a performance tool for being peer powered um, on the we, we have constant every funder across the country has different data and KPI things that they want to get. And uh, the biggest challenge in, um, in our system is continuing to get our infrastructure improved so that we've got the analytical ability to get things in real time. And so, you, you know, it, that involves using analytical tools like Power BI and stuff like that to be able to pull and create databases that you can pull data fields and then making sure that your staff is putting the right things in the right data field. Um, so one of the tools that we're really trying to implement for self-assessment self for us is something an acronym called the SMART tool, S-M-A-R-T, which is a self-modification for anti-racism tool. And it was developed by the American Association of Community for Psychiatry. And I'm involved in the clinical domain of that tool, which looks at, can you take, build into your system, looking at demographics of different racial groups and evaluate for racial disparities in treatment decisions, medication choices, diagnosis choices, seclusion and restraint, conversion from involuntary commitment to voluntary, and are there racial disparities in your system so that you can evaluate and, and work on that? Um, it's, it's complicated, though, to if you don't have those tools and the reporting teams to develop them in and then making sure that you're, you know, how many of your folks are you getting accurate demographics from or not? Because that's always an issue. And um, uh, it's SMART, Elizabeth, S-M-A-R-T. And if you type in SMART anti-racism tool, it comes up. It's a free tool to use. It's really good. I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, to, to think about it, it's both for your organization, in your leadership, and your hiring, and those kinds of principles, but also in the clinical domain. Um, and so having things like that and constantly looking at continuous quality improvement um, just helps us enrich our system. And that's where emergency medicine has been for, in the medical field, has been for decades, driving best care, best standards, what's the best way to manage a stroke when it happens, if the person comes in an hour after their stroke or 30 or 30 minutes after it, you know, and what are the, and you develop studies that show these are the best regimens and you look at it over time and do that kinds of things that we, we haven't in our emergency behavioral health world, haven't really gotten to that yet. Um, but it's things having tools like that and collecting data and sharing with each other is the frontier, I think, of where we got to go to learn what is the best practice and working on all those things. Um, and our, our whole system just needs more, um, development in that area but it's it's tough it's tough on that and so and i really appreciated you bringing up the methamphetamine as well because we have that a lot in our area but 
is there a level of alcohol intoxication where if ambulance or police bring someone in that you don't do that full detox protocol and you would recommend, you know, transfer them to a detox center? Kind of what's your level that you typically take? So um, if you guys are familiar with ASAM levels, our um, short-term units, called what, which we call living rooms, that have an average length of a stay of about 3.5 days average, um, are usually inf- have the infrastructure of a 3.7 ASAM level. So we are doing not what would be classified as non-medical detox for alcohol um, uh, on, that, on those units when, when it's indicated. So we do a triage. Um, with our nursing staff that includes an initial blood alcohol level. Um, and if they call, if a nurse calls me to ask about a person, it's going to be the initial, um, um, it's going to be the initial blood alcohol level. When did they last drink? What's their, what, have they had a history of bad complications like delirium tremens or DTs or seizures or hallucinations before? Um, and then those things are create a treatment protocol that we do with our providers on whether or not um, what, whether we're going to load somebody with medication, whether they're going to get a standing dose or whether it's just going to be driven on if symptoms come or not, because there's kind of three categories of risk. And so, um, where we do send somebody automatically out is if they are delirious, um, already look like they're in DTs. If they have such significant symptoms that they look like they're dehydrated or, um, need to have like IV kind of stuff. But our general rule of thumb, and it's, um, it's, it's one that's repeated a lot in the crisis world, is if they can sit down and eat a sandwich, it doesn't matter what the blood alcohol level is. It's just if they can sit down and eat a sandwich, and then you can manage it if you have the infrastructure to do the multivitamin and the thiamine and folic acid and medications to protect against withdrawal. Is that, did that help answer the question? So yes, you, you may have to send some, some people out, but you can manage a huge percentage of most of them if you have that infrastructure built in. Yes, that's awesome. Thank you. One of the movements I'll say for um, while we're talking about substance use and is one of the movements that's moving forward across the country now is doing inductions of buprenorphine, which is the generic of Suboxone uh, for people with opiate use disorder in emergency rooms. And so we started that several years ago in our site in North Carolina, and it's been really successful at being able to help people who normally, you know, we had a high rate of people when we could only offer symptom-based withdrawal management, and then they would go into like abstinence-based residential treatment or just go right back to the community not considered best practice. Um, and unfortunately, a, a lot of those people, high, high numbers of leaving that 3.7 level, even though they're getting medicines, medicines for symptoms, leaving against medical advice or early because they just couldn't tolerate the withdrawal. And so now that we can do inductions, people can actually leave like that day once it works and we get them connected to care. Or one of the other new modes that's happening is for people who are choosing an abstinence path um, a more humane way is to build up the infrastructure to do a, like a three or four day buprenorphine withdrawal management. So you're using it at a first dose to stop the withdrawal and then slowly taper it down for about four days as their next step. Um, it's still, again, that's not best practice because abstinence model for opiate use disorder is associated with higher death rates, overdoses, and lots of other complicated factors, but we still have pathways that people have the right to choose what they want to do or not do. And we'd like to make it smoother for them to be able to tolerate the withdrawal symptoms better and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Chuck. We do just have two minutes left. Any other questions people want to ask while we we have some expertise on the line as it were? Number one candy in the U.S. overall recently has been Snickers. I think it's the Betty White commercials. I don't know. But Reese's has been number one in the past. So don't forget the Reese's and thinking about how to pull these things together. Always learn something from you, Dr. Chuck. Um, Thank you so much for (laughs) for your presentation. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye.